Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everybody. I've got special guests today I'm talking to Dr. Derek Schmidt today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said Derek. Darren Schmidt. Dr. Darren Schmidt. It's been a long time coming, man. A lot of my audience has been requesting that we do some sort of a collaboration. A lot of people have been talking about how they love your YouTube channel, how you've helped them to, uh, to kind of reformat their lives, how you've helped them to, uh, to reformulate their diet. And I know you've been talking about ketogenic diets and even carnivorous diets for a little while now. So I figure it's time that we uh, that we cross paths and that we that we talk about all this all this keto craziness going on. <laughs> so you guys can find Dr. Darren Schmidt on YouTube. I've got a link down in the description to his YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, how are you doing today? I'm good, Tristan. How are you doing? Great. Yeah, I'm great. Great to finally be talking to yeah, you. Yeah, really. Great to finally meet you. Uh, so you run the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor. How long have you been? Uh, how long have you been doing this? So I started my chiropractic practice in '97, and then within a year, I focused on uh, nutrition. '98, and I moved around different offices. Um, I moved to Ann Arbor in 2000. From just my family's from a, an hour south of here, so I've been doing hardcore holistic nutrition since '98, and the idea has always been. See, let's see how much good we can do just with nutrients and food as opposed to medication. So I am a chiropractor and I decided as a, even as a kid, even at six years old, I knew I thought differently than most people. Um, and I just figured, you know, through school, I was like, let's see what good we can do just with nutrients. Nice, man. So, I mean, as a chiropractor, there are probably... There are quite a few other chiropractors who are into using nutrition as therapy. I think a lot of people might have um, even first come upon using nutrition to affect their health and to affect things like chronic inflammatory conditions and disease. A lot of people first came to this type of information from chiropractors. So, um, yeah, it's always an interesting journey to me to hear about. What what made you become a chiropractor? You bust your spine up when you were a kid? Oh, uh, no. Yeah, I was... Uh... So I went to college, went to Ohio State. Well, when I was a kid, I thought I'd be a doctor of some sort. And I, you know, people have those uh, ideas when they're young. I'm going to, you know, be whatever when I grow up. So in, at Ohio State, it was time for me to apply for medical school and take the MCAT entrance exam. And before I did that, I surveyed 12 people, doctors and students of medicine. And I asked them what they thought about the profession and none of them liked their profession. None of them encouraged me to go into medicine. So I figured, okay, well, I looked at podiatry and optometry and veterinary medicine. And then I spent a couple hours with a chiropractor in my hometown. And what he said was, you can have back pain or you can have leg pain caused by a problem in your back. And I thought, well, that's pretty holistic, you know, like head to toe, we're talking, here's a symptom in the leg, but the problems in the back. I, and I, and plus I saw that it was manual labor. And I grew up working on a family farm. I spent 17 summers, you know, driving forklifts and that kind of stuff. So I could see myself doing that work. So I applied for chiropractic school and I went and I had never been adjusted by a chiropractor. So it's my first uh, semester in chiropractic school and I got my first adjustment. So no, I didn't mess up my back or my neck. The idea was, you know, just to help people as much as I could. Uh, so what did the doctors tell you when you went to interview them? You were thinking about maybe becoming a physician. Um, what, was the, what was the vibe that actually led you to uh, deciding, no, I can't do this? I mean, they straight up told you we're not enjoying our job. We're not. Yeah, we're basically. Not. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, the, and some of them were students and uh, they didn't have a good attitude about their future career. A lot of people complain about paperwork and one guy member said he works one third of his hours is working with paper you know insurance claims and stuff like that and I was you know after 12 people I was like okay I don't need to it's there it's over 12 <laughs> I don't need to keep asking people questions anymore about this so yeah yeah so so chiropractic um you got in this in 1997 or was it 98 you said? I graduated in 97 and started the nutrition aspect in 98. Okay. All right. So the nutrition aspect, how did, how did that become one of the main factors that you focus on in your practice? I mean, you've, 
Um, obviously, a, a lot of chiropractors do manual therapy, manipulation of the spine, manipulation of the, uh, you know, of, of your back. What, uh, right. what led you to really digging deep into nutrition? Well, so when I was in school in 95, there's a guy, Dr. Joel Wallach. Do you know him? I've heard, I remember hearing him on the radio. Yeah, so, so back then his tagline was... Don't, don't lie, is that what it was called? Dead doctors don't lie, yeah. So I saw him give a lecture in 95, 95. And I was with some friends, and I was like so inspired in it. You know, what basically what he said was, the status of Americans' health is so low, it's because of our food supply, our diet is so bad. And I thought, well, that's what I need to focus on is helping people with their diet because that's the one common denominator. It's the food, and if we keep going down this path, it'll just get worse and worse. So but that's all these people are saying that the food has nothing to do with it, right? I mean, you got a lot of people out there talk about, oh, you know, organic food doesn't matter. These pesticides, they're all great. Glyphosate <laughs> is a nutrient. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of conflicting information out there, and a lot of people, even uh, uh, late, lately, a lot of people have been sending me links to Lane Norton. He's always putting out videos talking about how everyone's a zealot, right? Fighting the imaginary haters, telling everybody they're all zealots, they're all keto zealots. Um, what do you think about this this argument that food doesn't really play a, a, a very important part in this stuff? Well, I got to do is just experiment with that. So just eat nothing but moon pies for a year. There, solved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's funny because once you've actually experienced, you know, making these nutritional changes and, and using them to uh, you know, try to correct certain ailments, you realize how powerful it can be. Um, now, how did you, what was your dietary r routine like back in the day? I know you have a video, and I didn't watch this video because I wanted to ask you about it first. You have a video that said, why I'm no longer vegan. <laughs> so it seems like you did experiment with like a plant-based diet. I did, diet. yeah. Um, back in the day, it, don't be embarrassed. You can no. share. We've got a lot of ex-vegans in the chat here. We've even got a lot of future ex-vegans, which <laughs> are most current vegans. 85% of vegans in just a few years will have never been vegan. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, how, how long ago did you experiment with this? And when were you never really vegan? So that was 96 and in chiropractic school, I think that 25% of my class were vegetarian. And there was a guy that had a tofu hot dog, and it was called TVP, Textured Vegetable Protein. And he, had, and he was eating it in the hallway of the school, and he was like so content about you know, his decision, and he was so happy about it. And he, he's, he's like, it's not real meat. And he's like, like, that's the benefit, it's not real meat. So I decided, okay, I'm going to stop eating meat. And that was a disaster. That was a year, a little bit more than a year. And I remember my hair falling out. I was tired. There was a time one morning I woke up, this alarm went off, and I hit that snooze button like for over an hour. I couldn't get out of bed. I was cold. It was winter in Chicago. And, um, and then the, what broke it was my, I graduated, and I moved back home. And I lived with my sister in a farmhouse that my family has a commercial farm. And we have a farmhouse, and she threw a graduation party, and she bought a lot of bratwurst, and we had a lot left after the party. And so that first summer, this, now this is the summer of 97, I worked three days on the farm and three days in the office. And when I worked, the days I worked on the farm, I came home for, for lunch. I had two brats for lunch and three for dinner for a couple months. And I felt better. And, it's, and it, was, it was with white bread, you know. So, and then I went to a woman's, um, actually, a husband and wife, you know, Don Mattis? You know, that name sounds familiar. He's got a book out now, Hyper Carnivore. I've yeah. heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Does he have a blog called Hyper Carnivore? Well? Yeah. So at His the time... Hyper Carnivore on Twitter, right? I've seen him around. So at the time, he was married uh, uh, to someone else, and they had a little class in their living room, and I attended that. And that's when I learned about the Weston E. Price Foundation. And they said, there's, you know, there's value in eating dairy, it's the fat. And why would you take the fat out of the dairy? And I said, oh my gosh, you mean that fat is good? Fat can be good for you? So I started eating more fat, and then I dropped the carbs down. So now we're talking 2000, 2001. I stopped all the pop the last time I purchased a loaf of bread. Well, I, I purchased five loaves of bread since the year 2000. And both five, those times... Why five? Why five? Yeah. Well, the first time I bought three because... Um, I was experimenting with this thick, heavy 
you know, $6 loaf of bread thinking that it would give me energy or something. Let's just see what these, this unique rye bread would do for me. And it just caused gas. And then years later, <laughs> I had um, uh, mold problems, which is a whole thing. And uh, constipation was one of my symptoms. So I tried about two loaves of bread thinking maybe the extra fiber would help with that, but that didn't work. So that's why I bought five loaves of bread in the course of now 19 years. Wow. So that's been my journey. Keto, low, I've always been, I've been low carb since 2000, so less than 75 grams of carbs a day. And then recently experimenting more with carnivore. Now, when you first started out on the low carb thing back in the early 2000s, it wasn't very popular back then, right? I mean, no, was, not at all. You're still calling it Atkins. So there probably a lot of people who said what you were doing was similar to Atkins. What was, uh, there, was no, there wasn't even a paleo thing. No, it was kind of caveman. Lorraine or Lauren Corden, I think he had his book out. But I remember, I think it was 03, Dr. Mercola put out his book called The No Grain Diet. Do you remember that? Okay. Yeah, so I had that book. I put it on my shelf and I would tell patients, all right, I think the best thing for you to do is go low carb. And that means eat vegetables and some fruit, which is your dessert and just reduce the grains down to a bare minimum. And people would just freak out like, I can't do that. And then I would point to the book. What about my whole grain Cheerios? Yeah, and I would point to the book and it's, the title said The No Grain Diet. And then I had another book, it was 500 Low Carb Recipes. And so that's, that was my tool. But I remember a year after that book came out, Mercola did a video and he actually apologized for the title of the book. He didn't want to title that the publisher made it that title and he was trying to be inflammatory and trying to, you know, sell more books with the no grain diet book. But anyways, that, that was, and at the time, you know, we didn't have the macros put, you know, down. I didn't have the macros down like I do now, but see, so yeah, I've been teaching low carbs since I got into nutrition. Now, why would somebody want to remove grains from their diet? You know, I mean, we've got we've got quite a few people here who probably never heard of certain approaches like this. A lot of people are probably new to low carbohydrate diets. What is it about grains? What is it about a lot of these plant based foods that makes it difficult for us to digest? And that makes uh, well, why is it that so many people feel good when they eliminate some of these foods? Well, I think the number one there's two aspects of food related to health, and that's quantities and then quality. So grains are just super, super high in carbohydrates. The quantities are so high. And then the quality of the grains, meaning that's got the anti-nutrients and the inflammatory, you know, gluten. And, and then all the, there's other plant. I'm sure you already know this answer, but, you know, you got the phytic acid and tannins and salicylates and, and uh, all that that can cause harm. So just the chemical reaction. And the plants sit there on the ground and they don't have any defense mechanism other than poisonous chemicals, whereas animals will kick you, bite you, claw you, run away. Plants can't do that, so they punish you with their deadly poisons. And you know, I, I really consider if people can eat plants and they're okay with it and their body's okay with it, then good for you. You're one of the lucky ones. You know, and there's other people they can't handle meat very well. And if you can handle meat well, then good for you. You're one of the lucky ones. And if you can do both, good, you know, and that should be the basis of your diet is the healthy plants that your body likes and then as much fat and protein, you know, meat that your body needs and then stay away from all the processed junk. Yeah, it seems like that's one of the main issues is it's the, the processed foods, the junk food. Um, then, of course, most of the processed foods are based around the heavily glyphosated crops, right? I mean, right. You, as like a family uh, farmer, how do you feel about the modern agriculture system that we see today? I mean, we're seeing a big push for more of these grains. We're seeing a big push for more soy, more corn, more wheat, and even meat-based alternatives based around soy, <clears> corn, <throat> and wheat. Um, I think that's a really interesting angle. You coming from a small family farm? Well, it's, a, it's a large commercial family farm. Oh, large commercial it's, farm? Yeah. In 1937, my great-grandfather bought you know, 40 acres or whatever. And then they just kept acquiring land all around that space. So now currently at 700 acres. And um, most of the income for this, the family farm is actually bedding plants like and poinsettias, you know, and patients, flowers that you put around your house. So we have 14 acres of greenhouses. 
But, you know, when I was growing up, though, they, you know, and I'm working the fields, broccoli, squash, sweet corn, peppers. It was a truck farm, meaning you bring your truck in, load it up and drive the truck, truck away. That's what a truck farm is. Um, and you take it to farmer's markets. But then over the years, it became more commercialized. And now and then it just be and we had also a lot of potatoes. But as the prices dropped and as other countries were importing in, the prices of cabbage dropped too low. We stopped the cabbage. We stopped the potatoes. We stopped the sweet corn. And then it just became uh, Roundup Ready soybeans and the BT biotech corn and, you know, some commercial wheat. And the, the um, profit margin on that is so low. So then we just started renting out some of the fields to other farmers who were, you know, trying carrots and stuff like that. So anyways, the point, I remember going to a seminar with my dad. And it was a bunch of farmers in the audience. And I don't know who the speaker was, if it was a government agent or if it was a Monsanto or maybe a county agricultural department guy. But they're talking about... Three of them wrapped up into one seat. Yeah, exactly. But they're talking about the programs. You know, you buy this program. You plant this type of seed. You plant this exact seed. You spray these, these chemicals. Here's the spraying schedule. And you just, boom, it's a ready-to-do program. So I remember when we first started doing BT corn, my dad said that he was told that they would have to spray the corn less, and which was, you know, average nine times a year. But once they planted that particular seed, they actually had to spray it 11 times the next year. So they were lied to about how many times you had to spray. And I remember, I mean... Um, yeah, I remember exactly, I think it was 92 when we bought the, you know, there was uh, this Roundup Ready soybean, uh, like a bag of, of beans to be planted. And I remember stepping over this bag of Roundup Ready soybeans, like, what the heck does that mean? You know, what is this newfangled stuff? You know? What a trip. So, yeah, it's funny because that's a common thing. Farmers get told that, uh, that they're going to get higher yields and they're going to have to use less input, but then they end up having to take out loads of loans, they end up having to purchase lots of um, machinery, and of course many can't afford the machinery without like IMF loans and stuff, and this has kind of been a, a model in the third world for taking over the agricultural system and uh, essentially forcing everybody to purchase patented seeds, uh, the BT corn and the uh, the glyphosate. Uh, did, did you guys, did you notice any, I mean, did you have exposure to glyphosate a lot as a kid? Did you was that something you were exposed no, to? No, by the early 90s, now I'm in college and, you know, chiropractic school. And there were, but earlier than that, I, 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 I spent a summer, or not a summer, but a few weeks helping the sprayer. The guy with the big, I did a video about this. He got those really tall corn sprayers that look like spiders going through the fields. And they have these nozzles that drop down between the stalks of corn. Yeah. So my job was to drive the tractor that had the water tank behind it. We had this wagon with a... You could put two tons of water in this big plastic container. So I drove from field to field, and the guy spraying would then, he would spray, and he would meet me, mix the chemicals, spray, and then I'd go to the next field. Well, one time I walked underneath that corn sprayer, and it was um, idle, and one drop fell on my back, and it, and it was um, not glyphosate. It was parathion, which is an organophosphate, which has been banned. And it was diluted, 200 parts water. It might have been banned there, but I bet it's not banned in Latin America because there are a lot of pesticides that you could just buy by the gallon. They've been banned in the Western world, but then the reps come down to South America and sling it to all the other people. Right, yeah. It's been banned in like 30 countries, but there's a lot of other countries that can still purchase it. But it put me to sleep. It was a diluted drop, and it put me to sleep for 20 minutes. And, um, I, and my health was never the same until I actually got into the detox part of my practice. Um, but we had a neighbor die from the organophosphate. He had one drop fall on his boot. It was a leather boot with a steel toe. And he ignored it because he thought his boot would protect him. And he just killed over that night. He was dead at the uh, kitchen table. He just like fell over. So my, what saved me though was that mine was diluted 200 parts parathion to five, I'm sorry, 200 parts water to five parts parathion. Yeah. And you know, I, let me kind of change the subject just a little bit. It's related. And I know you'd be interested in this. So when you look at our, at our acres, 
there's one section that's about 550 acres or maybe a little bit more now. And it's pretty sterile. So in Northwest Ohio, it's all flat. And there's, a lot, there's large commercial farms there. You know, our neighbors have like 3,000 acres or 1,500 acres. We're one of the sm smaller ones. And um, you can drive down the road. And you can see three miles to your right and, you know, five miles straight ahead. There's no hills. And it's actually quite beautiful. But there's no animals. <laughs> there's no animals. So in the 60s, you know, some of the guys, you know, I started working in the 80s when I was nine years old. These guys had stories where they would, you know, like you go to the stream and you straddle the stream and you just grab the fish and you just throw the fish onto the ground, you know, like onto the land. That's how you fish because the streams are stocked with fish and turtles. But all the time that I was there, like I never saw turtles. I never saw deer. I never, you know, there, it's very, very sterile with all those chemicals spraying. Now, there was a time when I was driving the, okay, so imagine the corn picker, you know, going through the fields. I'm driving the wagon next to it, and it's my cousin. He's picking the corn, and the conveyor belt dumps the corn into the wagon that I'm driving. And it's like sort of the sun is just starting to come up. So it's, you know, probably, you know, 6 or, you know, 5.45 a.m. And we're finishing this field by the woods. And I swear to God, between me and the track, between the tractor and the corn picker, there's about five rabbits that scampered away from the machines into the woods. And I thought I was seeing stuff, you know, like I said, like it was a little bit dusk, you know, a little bit, a little bit dark or whatever. But it's just an example of like all those acres, what all those acres used to be, you know, filled with rabbits and you know, raccoons and all those, all those animals, you know, thousands and thousands of animals on 500 acres. So the commercialization of agriculture has been so devastating to the wildlife, to mother nature, to the earth, you know? Well, and what could you do? I mean, so with, with land that you've already grown BT corn on, it's already had a lot of glyphosate sprayed on it. What else could one do with that land after it's already been used for growing corn with glyphosate? Well, it takes three years to let the to make the land organic again by law, which is probably not enough. But you just yeah, start right. playing. What's the half life on on the glyphosate? No, it turns into another chemical I think called AMPS. So glyphosate breaks down, but then you got another poisonous chemical. So the glyphosate in the soil will go up, but the AMPS goes up even higher, and that's been studied. The USDA knows all that all that data. So what do you do? You just grow some some grasses. You keep growing hay or something, and then you gotta plow that under, and then do it again and plow it under. So you want to get that green fertilization back into the soil. So I mean, it's a huge investment to actually turn land that's been used for commercial agriculture to then go back to organic agriculture. You probably got a significant amount of money that's gonna need to put into it because it's got to sit fallow first. Yeah, it's a huge loss. Right. It's it's a huge loss. And then later, the idea is to get turn it into a, a you know a profit. Yeah, but man, you gotta. You, you, that's a that's a lot of work. And I told my dad this. I said, "Can't you go organic?" He goes, "I'm too old." <laughs> right. I mean, think about how stressful it's, it is too. Yeah, and there's a lot of families involved. You know, it's like you're gonna put all these families' income at risk. You know, you're gonna put the land fallow for three years and. Yeah, put everything on hold. Everybody just hold on. You're not going to have any income for half a decade while we while we revamp our business model. Right. Uh, it's hard. It's almost it like the farmers get kind of trapped in it. Right, for sure, yeah. Yeah, but there are solutions. And I remember I went to a seminar once by a guy. He's a farmer, organic farmer. And there's also a standard process, which is one of my favorite supplement companies. They have their organic farm. So they're using, they're probably growing like 400 acres right now, and they have 1,000 acres that are waiting you know, if they need more production, but there are, there are answers. And if somebody wants to start off new and they're fresh out of school and they're excited to be a new farmer, yeah, there's definitely some really good resources out there. There's permaculture and all that. Now, now as somebody who comes from a family who's doing so-called conventional, uh, they call it conventional now, which is kind of a funny propaganda term, right? But, uh, you know, commercial farming, uh, what are your thoughts on organic versus non-organic? You know, I mean, if somebody is uh, in the grocery store trying to figure out what they want to eat, right? I mean, there's the organic veggies might cost twice as much. The non-organic avocados might be half the price. So what are your 
What's your opinion on that? Well, my opinion is organic's always better, but conventional is fine. And there was a study where they tried to determine how many Americans die each year from commercial food. And they came up with a number, and it was 10. So out of 310 million people in the United States, 10 might die from commercial, like, non-organic food. Mm. How did they, do you know how they, how they mm. came up with that stat? No, I don't, no. So 10 of you guys watching right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then when it comes to meat, let's talk about meat. Yeah. Organic's always better. It's the same statement, organic's always better, but if you gotta go with commercial, then don't kill yourself over it, you know, like, Go ahead and buy Not that. You can afford grass fed. I mean, shoot, very few people can afford all grass fed meat. And then, and then have access to it. So here I am in Ann Arbor, which is a pretty uh, intelligent town, I guess I could say. And then one town over, it's called Manchester, Michigan. I have a, a meat CSA, community supported agriculture. So once a month, she drops off our shares, and that's been fantastic. The best pork. I've ever had the best bacon I've ever had. I get a supply of this, you know, week, uh, monthly. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and then, of course, supporting local agriculture means there's less shipping, means hopefully you can get it at a better price as well. And also, you know, a lot of people are concerned with so-called sustainability. Um, we talked about the sustainability issue on this uh, show plenty of times, and that's been kind of a common theme. Um, uh, most for most people that are telling you about sustainability, it means sustainability for their profits. So as far as you know, beef being unsustainable and um, you know these foods being unsustainable, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of trickery going on in uh, in, in the, the wording conversation about these right. things. So, uh, yeah. People saying, "Oh, it's not sustainable if you're going to have grain finished beef. It's terrible for the environment." Um, Oh, what do you think about that, about the claim that, you know, grain-finished beef, bad for the environment, going to cause issues, uh, you know, greater issues with sustainability, and we need to be going towards all grass-fed beef? What would you say about that sentiment that you see out there? Well, I, th what I have to say about that is more related to what Sean Baker says about it, because he's got new information that I didn't know about. Um, so grain-finished cows are, like, eating grain for, like, six months. And it does change the fats of the animals more towards omega-6. We want to do more omega-3. That's the grass-finished cows. So it's better for your health, at least, to do the grass-finished cows. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think uh, another interesting caveat, though, is that the amount of omega-3, 6, 9 fatty acids, the amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids in grass-fed or grain-fed beef are both very, very low, right? So the grain-fed beef that you're going to be getting, even though it's not going to have as good of a uh, you know omega six to omega three ratio, whereas grass fed will, will favor omega three. The so called conventional beef that's finished on grain still has such a small amount of PUFA polyunsaturated fatty acids in it that for most people it, it doesn't seem to be much of an issue. In fact, a lot of people end up preferring the grain finished beef just due to the sustainability of their wallet uh, issue. Right? I mean, it's it's cheap. You got more fat for less money. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm all about people over ideals, you know, right. ideally we would have grass fed everything, everything would be organic. We wouldn't be using glyphosate for anything, but you know, if you can't afford it and that's what you can feed your family, I'd way rather have you feeding your family on the Costco meat than, you know, buying beyond burgers from, <clears throat> from, um, from Carl's Jr. Right. Yeah. The, the, definitely the biggest issue for mega six is the, is the deep fried everything. And the vegetable oil, seed oil, everything, all the salad dressings, you know, all that stuff. That's the bigger issue. And you can reverse that omega. Let's say, let's say your omega sixes are at 40 to 1 ratio over omega threes. You could still reverse that in like th six months, uh, you know, as tested in a, in a blood test. Yeah. So just get, you know, cut out all the deep fried garbage and take some fish oils, eat some good fish, and eat some grass fed beef. Yeah. And I, I want to, what you said was people over ideals. Yeah, that's awesome. I like what you say when you talk like that. I'm with you 100% on that. Oh, you yeah, know? I think it's super important, man. It's like people get all caught up in how they think the world should be and what everyone should be eating. And, you know, you, if you ever shop at Walmart, then you're ruining the world. I mean, it's look, there's, there's people who all they've got is Costco. 
that's all they've got in some of these towns in the U.S. That's all they've got. Yeah, and it's not bad. (laughs) What's that? And it's not bad. Costco. You do what you can, right? I'd rather have um, have healthy people uh, than than a bunch of you know sickly, uh, soy fed humans. Right, and if you have healthy people, the idea is healthy brain, ability to read better, ability to comprehend, to Ability to override your emotions and to actually analyze instead of being caught up in emotions. And then you can see the world for what it is and see the problems for what they are. And then fix the problems. And fi- but, the, but even before that, find the real problem. You know, the real problem. Not Don't make up problems or don't think that something's a problem when it's not. And if, somebody's, if everybody's sick and they're eating soy and they're not eating meat and their brain doesn't work very good... Then they're going to not find the right problems, and they're going to have solutions to things that it just messes things up. Now, so. now, what are some of the, what is the problem with the standard American diet? You mentioned a lot of people not eating meat, and how that could be a problem. Now, that might be completely the opposite of what some other people would be recommending out there, especially a lot of these uh, uh, plant-based doctors uh, who are out there re- uh, representing the, the vegan movement, right? So, you've got a lot of different opinions on what human beings should eat. And you mentioned meat as an important part of the diet. Why the heck do we need meat? Why can't we just go get an Impossible Burger? Why can't we just eat some soy? Why can't we just eat the, uh, you know, the Beyond Burger uh, funded by Bill Gates, Tyson Foods, and the Saudi royal family, Saudi royal princes who own part of Twitter? Um, so, yeah, shout out to all of you, Bill Gates and Plant Based News out there for bringing us the Beyond Burger. But why do you think that might not be better than meat? <laughs> well, I mean, meat is the original superfood. It's what everybody's ancestors ate. And um, the, when you look at the nutrient density and the quality of the nutrients, and uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, carnitine to facilitate ketosis that's in meat. I'm a big fan of the uh, heme iron and the myoglobin that's in red meat. I'm a, there's a huge difference, and I can tell... Red meat versus white meat, chicken or whatever. The difference in strength and endurance and the ability to go longer between meals with red meat versus the other types of meat. So, yeah, I just think, I just think it's an essential food. I mean, I don't think it. I know it. And the only reason why, I mean, I see people who choose to not eat meat for ethical reasons, meaning they don't want to kill animals. That's fine. Um, but there are people who are sick from eating meat. And so then they come to see me and it's like, okay, we got to see if it's your gallbladder. Or do you need some more hydrochloric acid for your stomach? Maybe it's your pituitary not working very well, telling your stomach to make hydrochloric acid. You know, like what aspect of your body can't digest the meat? So when I had black mold poisoning three years ago, the summer of 2016, I didn't eat red meat for six months. I couldn't. I was nauseous. And it wasn't the red meat's fault, though. That's the problem. There's a, there's a problem with the human body. We, you know, with that patient's body that they can't eat the meat, they can't digest it well. And then some people are just built for um, low meat diets. And people tell me that on the phone when I talk to them, they're like, yeah, I just never had the taste for it. And their health is good because they're doing what their body's telling them to do. So I'm not anti-vegan. I'm not anti-meat. I'm not anti... I'm for the diet that works best for your body. So the St. American diet, though, with garbage, with pop, with all the sugar, that's not for anybody's body. <laughs> I mean, Cheerios and Lucky Charms are not the ideal breakfast for... No, it's, it's rather unfortunate, though. With all the colors of the boxes and the food dyes, it looks so scrumptious. It looks like fruit. It looks like... Yeah, it, but, yeah, it's not good for you. <laughs> you get Disney characters telling you how good it is. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. So what are some of the most common, I mean, you're, you're working as a practicing chiropractor for over 20 years now. What are some of the most common ailments that you see? Um, I mean, you're obviously probably seeing the obesity crisis and getting hands-on with the obesity crisis, but what are some of the other problems that people seem to be running into more and more these days with the standard American, the standard Western, the, uh, um, the, the McDiet? That we the McDiet, yeah. Well, McDiet. Yeah, let me just clear, clarify this. So I haven't accepted a new chiropractic patient in probably 10 years. So everybody that comes to me, they're here for nutrition. <clears throat> and um, so most people, I, I get a wide variety of cases. So 
some of my videos I talk about heart issues and getting the calcium out of the arteries. So I get um, men and women with that. Uh, I get people that want to lose weight. I get people that want to do fasting for weight loss or, you know, they're trying to get rid of their type 2 diabetes. I also get the weird stuff, autoimmune. Um, <clears throat> I like those tough cases. I like solving puzzles. Um, what sets me apart from most other doctors in this field is I do the muscle testing biofeedback procedure so I can get responses back from the body like what's going on and how we can fix it. So even, yeah. Now, what, what is your, so you mentioned getting calcium out of the arteries. Uh, this is something a lot of people have concern with, the standard American diet. We've got a lot of inflammation, chronic inflammation, chronic uh, hyperinsulinemia, very, very rampant these days. A lot of people, blood sugars all over the place. There seems to be a connection between hyperinsulinemia and heart disease. Um, but what, as far as like nutritional therapy, what types of approaches have you used or do you use when you're looking at heart health, when you're looking at um, removing, as you call it, uh, calcium from arteries? Well, for heart health and getting the calcium out, it's ketosis. And the other thing is um, I, have a I have some supplements that can help with that. And they work with the biochemistry of the body. Of, of course, they're not drugs. But, you know, it's just physiology. It's just how is your body working? And what can we do to facilitate uh, getting the calcium that's in the soft tissues and put it in the right place or, or get it out of the body? So I have a couple different protocols for it. And, I'm, and it's a long-term process here where I have some people, now it's been over a year. I have one guy, it's been four years where, you know, we did one protocol and it worked and we did another protocol and it also worked, but it didn't work as good. So I'm trying to figure all this out. And I base this on everybody's, everybody's an individual. So it's all one-on-one -on -one consulting. Yeah. Now, you mentioned supplementation for heart health, for removing calcium from arteries. The only thing that comes to mind that I know about is, you know, vitamin K2 obviously being really important for calcium homeostasis. A lot of people supplementing with vitamin D. Yeah. It's been shown that supplementation, heavy supplementation, especially with vitamin D, can lead to calcium being deposited in places in the body that you don't want it. Uh, so is vitamin K2 something that you like to look at? Oh, yeah, for sure. K2 and D3 together to help. I once had a kid that he had a weird, um, he was born with this weird like chest problem. And I put him on lots of K2 and D3 and it fixed it. You know, like that kind of stuff. But with the heart, getting back to the heart and arteries, I have supplements with whole food vitamin C that will heal the tissue, enzymes on an empty stomach to get rid of unwanted proteins and inflammation, load them up with fats to calm down inflammation and to make the blood slippery and um, there's other specific fats that can make the calcium in the arteries ionizable so that the calcium can actually leave the arteries so there's, diff there's a lot of different types of nutrients that can facilitate the healing of the heart and arteries and i don't so it seems like low carbohydrate approach is pretty common in your practice oh yeah for sure yeah but we also have other diets, antifungal diet, antiviral diet, um, Whole30 diet, which is low allergen. So we have a lot of different tools. But what um, do you think about, I mean, you've seen the rise of the carnivore diet. A lot of people get into a ketogenic diet, trying to get their health together. They start realizing that they got to take it a step further. They realize that maybe, uh, maybe the oxalates were an issue, which for a lot of people they are, especially people who come from former vegetarian vegan diets where they're loading up on oxalate-rich foods. Uh, even people come into a keto diet, uh, who've had significant amounts of antibiotics as a kid, like myself. You know, I grew up taking a, um, amoxicillin and you know, just various antibiotics for various reasons. A lot of people's guts are messed up, and they're not able to handle some of these plant foods. What do you think about like a carnivore diet? What is your experience with this whole carnivore craziness that you see going on now? Uh, especially uh, in the social media, a lot of people are getting really interested in this elimination diet that basically leaves them eating all meat. Very heretical. What do you think? <laughs> so I've actually had some patients where I told them, you, you got to go carnivore. You just have to try it. And I've had uh, really good results with it. Some people get constipated from it. Um, and so I personally started to go more carnivore maybe four or five months ago. And before then, I was eating red meat twice a week. And then I just decided one day to go carnivore. And I, ate, I had almost two pounds of meat that, that first day. I felt so good, so strong, slept like a baby, 
Three days later, all my chest pain was gone that I had from the black mold. A week later, I broke my chest press record. Um, so I still eat some plants now, um, but there are some days where I just eat nothing but meat. And then when I eat plants, all I eat, I eat iceberg lettuce. I have iceberg lettuce salads, and I put some meat on top of it, and some salad dressing, some maybe some cheese or some seasonings. But that's it for plants. I don't buy carrots. I don't. I did get some celery recently, but man, I don't. You know, my refrigerator is not filled with vegetables. Let me just put it that way. Priority is not the vegetables at this point, right, Doctor Garrett? What's your fridge look like, man? What's your fridge stock with right now? Um, I have, I just did a big crock pot. So I'm trying to empty my freezer for more meat, right? So I had a ham hock, two packages of lamb stew. This is from my local farmer. And I had, what was the other thing I had? Oh, some big bone, soup bones that were beef. I just put them all in the crock pot and some salt. And I let it cook for 12 hours and I ate the meat. I ate all the meat on that, on that day. This was Saturday. It felt fantastic. And I still have all that bone broth in there. And I'm on the phone with my girlfriend. And I was like, you know, my it kind of smells like a cadaver lab. <laughs> so she and I are both chiropractors. We went to the same school and we dissected human bodies. And, you know, we walked into this lab and I, I said to her, it smells like a, a cadaver lab without the formaldehyde. And she goes, well, maybe next time you should use some aromatics. And I'm like, wait, what a minute. What, what, what are you saying? She's like, garlic, put in some thyme, put in some onions. And I'm like, oh, my God. That's why they use all the herbs to get rid of that smell, you know, to make that That's more. That's so funny because a lot of people who've done keto for a long time, like myself, they end up finding that. I mean, I, I love herbs, right? I love spices. I love plants. I love the medicinal aspect of many plants. Fascinating to me. Um, I grew up smoking way too much of a certain plant as a kid. You know, I've got, I've got relationship with plants. I, I got respect for the plants, but it's funny. Like after the years of doing more, uh, more of a meat based diet, I don't ever put spices on stuff these days. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm basically, I'm salt and it's meat and salt and it's, and that does it for me. In fact, I feel like the spices now take away from the taste of the meat. Yeah. So if I'm going to make a steak or something, I want to yeah. taste the steak. I want to taste the fat. I want to taste the mineral content of that, of the steak. Whereas if I put the uh, the spices on it, it kind of robs it. So yeah, I'm with you 100. percent And so, and and look at my background being a you know growing up on this commercial farm. I'm telling you, I I've touched so many plants <laughs> every summer, whether it was in the greenhouses or in the fields. I'm like I'm I was done with plants when I was a kid, and I don't do uh, herbs for seasoning. I never did. I just I just want to eat meat, you know. I just like the meat. So you find yourself moving towards a more carnivorous diet, kind of naturally as well, after all these years of, uh, of a low carb, uh, low, low carbohydrate approach. Yeah, just because my body's responding so well to it, and I feel so good, and my brain's working so good all day long. It's been fantastic. It's I like find that a lot of people who've failed with keto, as far not even failed. I mean, I've seen a lot of. We get a lot of clients. We do every month. We were doing it every other month, but now we do it every month. We do our Keto and Carnivore Collective. So for the audience who's watching uh, the next Keto and Carnivore Collective, the sign-up is this week. We're starting on March 3rd. So I haven't really talked about it much this month on the channel. So announcing the Keto and Carnivore Collective starting next week for March. But um, what we find, though, is that a lot of our clients who've had moderate success with the ketogenic diet, and these aren't just the average person who's trying to lose body fat. I'm talking about people who have, you know, you talked about the difficult cases, right? So people who've got chronic inflammatory conditions, autoimmune conditions, you know, chronic gout, arthritis, um, IBS, Crohn's and stuff like that. I, I have never found something more powerful than a carnivorous diet for helping people out with these things. I mean, I've got somebody we, uh, we spoke to yesterday in the Keto and Carnivore Collective. She was just amazed because she's been about six weeks working with me now. And we started moving towards a more carnivorous approach, basically removing oxalate from the diet. So she's not on a 100% carnivore diet, but she's doing a very low oxalate diet. She's very mindful of the oxalates. So just like you, she likes just the straight iceberg lettuce, and those are the more low oxalate vegetables a lot of people can handle. This woman wasn't able to walk without um, braces for months. And she took her braces off this month and said she walked up and got her mail. And all her friends and neighbors that she barely knows were clapping for her, were applauding her. They're just so impressed. 
And you know, there are cases like this over and over again that keep showing me the power of simply removing the plant toxins or going on a very elemental, almost carnivore or sometimes fully carnivore diet. And I just, I don't know yeah. anything else that's as powerful as that. So yeah, so I've learned recently the bridge then really between ketosis and the carnivore diet. So this guy named Dr. Ted Naiman, do you know him? Yeah. So his website, it's, well, P-T-O-E-R.com, which means protein to energy ratio, P-T-O-E-R.com. And um, so it comes down to this, you got, and there's the unified theory of food, you know, Brian Sanders? You know, that the name doesn't actually sound familiar. Okay, so he's making a movie called Food Lies. And I listened oh, to a, dude. No, I talked to Brian. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Brian's, so he. Sorry, Brian. The <laughs> Brian. So, like he, just, so he talked about the. Uh, it's great. He talked about the unified theory of food, and when I heard this, it's like pff, you know, blow your mind out. Where you have the protein, you got three things that maintain the structure of your body: protein, vitamins, and minerals. And you keep those up as high as you need to, as high as you want. Then you got two fuels: you got carbohydrates, bring those down, and then the fats. If you want to lose weight, bring them down once you're in ketosis. And then you can, if you want to raise their fats up, if you're like an endurance athlete or whatever, you want more energy from fats, you can raise the fats up. So you can keep both the carbs and the fats down, protein up, still be satisfied. And that's where it comes down to the meat. So Ted Naiman was saying that in a podcast, he was saying that he eats ribeye steaks and eggs and everything else is leaner than that when it comes to the meat, and then, of course, you know, the carbohydrates are super low. So that was brilliant. So that's the, that's the relationship there. And he's in ketosis all the time. So you just eat meat, you're in ketosis all the time. And that's something I wrestled with. I got onto Twitter really actively in, ju in June, or maybe later, and people are saying they're nothing, eating nothing but meat and they're in ketosis all the time. It's like, wait a minute, how can that possibly be? Well, there's this fallacy that protein causes gluconeogenesis and kicks you out of ketosis. That's not a true statement. So we're all evolving. You know, we're, we're all learning this, all the low-carb docs and all the low-carb health advocates and the keto people. We're all learning that, yeah, you can raise your protein up. And if you ever told somebody the wrong advice, you're forgiven. <laughs> there you go, you guys. The, he forgives you, Dr. Darren <laughs> <laughs> Because I forgive myself. There you go. <laughs> Your protein, the gluconeogenesis is going to kill you because extra protein turns in to carbohydrate, just like chocolate cake in your belly. It's not true, guys. And we've been talking about this for a while. So thanks a lot for bringing that up. I find that one of the most common problems that people run into, especially for fat loss, is under eating on protein on a ketogenic diet. Right. And you've, how many years, you've known this for years now. You've talked about this for a while, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been doing this for like five years. Uh, we've been doing a ketogenic diet for about six years, been coaching people on it for like five. Uh, the first six months to a year when I was working with people on this and when I was doing it with myself, I didn't really understand this so well. You know, I mean, I wasn't constantly measuring my ketones either. I was never sold on the measure your ketones obsessively craze. But uh, yeah, I just ended up finding that a lot of people were under eating on protein. I'm talking like you know, women eating 40, 50 grams of protein a day when really they should be at 80 to 90 grams minimum for their size, for their level of muscle mass. And it, they run into problems, man. Um, hunger doesn't go low if you don't get enough of the protein. And that's what Ted Naiman uh, really does a good job of talking about. He, he brings up the protein leverage hypothesis. And I think that's a really good keyword for anybody who wants to understand what the heck protein does in your body, why it's so important. We're trying to lose body fat. We're trying to burn your own body fat. The protein leverage hypothesis says essentially what Dr. Darren J Schmidt was just saying. If you get enough protein, you're not going to be hungry and you're going to be burning fat. If you want to burn fat from your plate or your body, you just adjust your fat intake accordingly. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. So the, the, the carnivore diet, you've been messing with this for a few months now. Do you find that it gets better and better with time? Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a very good point. Yeah, it gets better and better. Month after month, I can see the differences, the improvements. Yeah. What do you think is going on? Huh? You know, some people, they get on carnivore, they're like, wow, I feel so much better. F those plants, the plants are the problem. I tend to take a much more nuanced approach. I don't think the plants are an issue for a lot of people, but for some, they obviously are. Um, why do you think carnivore is so powerful? Why it's so powerful? Just because, of the, just because of the evolutionary aspect of it. So, like, my ancestry is... 
more German. So what did Germans eat a thousand years ago or 11,000 years ago between October to May? You know, they just ate, they just ate animals, basically. So in Weston A. Price, when he traveled the world, he said all tribes, um, there were no tribes that were vegan. All tribes had meat. All tribes had some sort of raw meat. And the one tribe that was the most vegetarian, they lived on the top of a mountain in the South Pacific Island. And they lived on the top, and their enemies were at the bottom. And so if they came down to fish, they might get killed by their enemies. Do you know this story? Yeah, they would actually still trade. <laughs> the women would trade. The, the women from the, the bottom part of the island of the mountain, they came up with fish, and they had a halfway point, and they dropped the fish off. And then the women from the top brought down fruit, and they would exchange that way. So yeah, there was that. Medicinal plants and fruits, they would, they would <clears throat> trade for the people. And these are mortal enemies, right? But they realized <laughs> they needed certain resources from the coast, even though they weren't, they weren't allowed on that land. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good um, anecdote from that book. Yeah, that, was that a, when did you first read that book? Because I remember reading Weston A. Price's book and looking at his information. It's definitely a game changer for me coming out of a plant-based diet and realizing, oh, wow, these issues that I saw in myself, in my daughter, the suffering that my daughter had to go through, losing her baby teeth because of the nutritional deficiencies that we were, uh, that we were uh, having before uh, she was born. I realized that this is common and this is not something that needs to happen. Well, right. When did you first read Weston A. Price and what kind of uh, impact did that information have on your journey? It was in the late 90s. Um, I don't know if it was 98 or something. 99. It was after 99. And yeah, that was the, the premise then of my nutritional practice was like, okay, I got the, I had been to some supplement seminars and I, the next year, learned Weston A. Price. So I was just trying to combine that together. And I want to bring up this. So when you look at various low carbers now, you got Tim Noakes and you got Brian Fetke and, you know, both those guys were attacked for promoting the low carb diet. Of course, Atkins, you know. But if you go back, who was the first person to really get attacked? It was Weston Price and the Weston A. Price Foundation. You know, they're the ones that, you know, they're the, the giants that we stand upon their shoulders. You know what I mean? So I was just going to give a shout out to Sally Fallon and... <laughs> They're the ones that have gotten a lot of this, a lot of us onto this. Likewise, Sally Fallon's book, the um, what was it called, Nourishing Traditions. That was uh, that was oh, a yeah. big game changer for us. I mean, that's like what got us into a very low carbohydrate diet uh, <clears throat> back in 2012, no, 2013. Uh, we started really implementing those principles. I think I think they get some stuff. I think some of it's not as applicable to me and you know many other people as well. I think the grains, even if they're soaked, even if you're fermenting your oats, which we used to do quite a bit, I still think that can be an issue for a lot of people. It yeah, might not be ideal foods. Well, I, I asked. I actually asked Sally that specific question. She had a seminar. It was like the Weston A. Price Foundation annual conference. It was in Ann Arbor, and I think the year was like oh two. And there's probably about in oh two. I wasn't even thinking about being healthy back in oh <laughs> two. Like I was, I was eating pop tarts and, uh, and burritos from the Mexican food restaurant. Yeah, and so I asked her specifically, "Why do you have a chapter on grains in your book?" And she said, "Because there were uh, traditional tribes that did well with grains for many, many centuries or millennia." And I was like, "Okay, that makes sense." Now, Weston Price, when he traveled the world, he said that the healthiest people ate red meat and plants, and then the second healthiest group of people ate fish and plants, and then the third healthiest people, the lowest of the three, were farmers primarily eating plants. That was his observation. And then, and all that's observation, you know. So like when Weston Price and the, and the foundation, when they talk about diet, they had the observational studies. They had the, you know, the, the I want to say accurate observational studies, the intelligent way of looking at it. And now we have more... Um, exposure to the randomized control trials, you know, so the randomized control trials are showing how important it is to have the meat in there, the animal fat and protein. Yeah, the, um, the grains thing is pretty interesting, right? I think when you look at the, uh, the section in, in the book, in nutrition and physical degeneration, for those of you who are interested in the book, 
Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, great book. Um, I think it's influenced Dr. Darren Schmidt and myself both. Um, the section on the, the Scottish folks and the Hebrides, or the Hebrides, how you pronounce it, islands, they were living off of mostly all fish and a very small amount of oats. But they had, oh, to, yeah. they had to take great care to even grow the oats because no other plants other than like a peat moss even grew on this island. So to grow the oats, they would have to, uh, they'd be burning wood. And then the thatch roof that was made out of moss, they would take the thatch that was all in, imbued with the smoke and they would use that to fertilize their oats and they would eat some small amounts of oats. And these were healthy, strong, happy people living off of almost all meat and just a little bit of oats. And some of them weren't eating much of the oats at all. So, right. Um, yeah, there, there definitely is. And they're just eating fish. Nice observation in these other tribes. A lot of people using certain grains, but they always prepared them in a very specific way. Right, and they so they're primarily eating the the fish in that group, and I, I don't remember if it was that group of people, but they had a green slime around their teeth. It was the biofilm of their their oral microbiome. So, and they had perfect teeth, no cavities, perfect structure, and that green slime in their mouth and their teeth was part of their normal biome, which made them really healthy. The other thing I want to say in O two when when I was at that seminar and Sally was speaking. Some guy raised his hand and he said, so do you think that the Agenda 21, um, what one of their goals is, is to depopulate the world? And, you know, asking Sally's opinion on that. And she said, yes, and their tool is soy. So you have more soy flooding in, you lower the sperm counts, you lower fertility, and that's the World Health Organization. And that was O2. You know what's funny? In 2001... Uh, there's this company called Epicyte, and they came out and they announced this on, I think it was September 9th or 10th, 2001, and then nobody really talked about it after this, but Epicyte announced that they had come up with a variety of corn that would save the world, and the way that this corn was going to save the world is not exactly how you would expect. Um, it was going to save the world by sterilizing the people who ate it. Okay. It was a corn variety that was actually a spermicidal corn. And this was announced in 2001. The company ended up being bought out. Uh, there were uh, defense, the, the defense department, the Department of Defense, did tests with this strain of corn, though, and it has been grown and uh, grown in tests, but not you know publicly sold to us as far as we know. But I thought that's a really interesting connection there too just a year before that a company announced that they had spermicidal corn that uh, would create antibodies to sperm yeah it's the anti-human agenda right you got people that don't like other humans so let, how can we destroy them you know it's horrible yeah, it's really sick it's really sick it's like mind state to look at other people and think oh that's the problem it's yeah so i so i still consider myself new on twitter and i you know like i've been on youtube professionally now for five years and um and tw with twitter it's like i wasn't ready for the sort of attacks i was getting from especially from vegans but there was a time when i had about 30 vegans attacking me because i had i made a stance regarding the vegan diet for children and then over time over a weekend a lot of those people went away in the conversations but there were some that were remaining and I looked up who they were in their biography, and they were vegan for the animals. They were ethical. They were, you know, animal rights. And I realized, like, okay, there's nothing I can say to make them change their mind. There's no logical thinking. Because everything I say stands for, hey, humans need to eat meat, and therefore animals will have to die. So I'm bringing this up because that's the anti-human agenda. Also, too, with the ethical vegans, the ones that, you know, will do everything and anything to prevent the the killing of another of another animal, so I just want to bring that up. If, unless they're aborting, unless it's an abortion, because then that's good. Of a unless human, not, right? Of a human, because that's the anti-human agenda. Human babies, right? You don't hear any of the vegans talking about nine-month abortions being legalized in New York, but you hear them talking about the poor crickets, or you're going to kill a cow and eat the cow, and um, you know the the fruit flies are suffering. We need to end the, the suffering of the fruit flies. But they don't seem to care too much about. Children be, uh, children be killed. Right, so humans first. Humans before ideals. Yeah, I think that that's uh, 
across the board with diet uh, and with uh, you know sustainability and all these things, we really have to consider that. And if you're not putting people before animals, if you're not putting people before um, you know your own personal preferences right. uh, of diet or whatever it is, then I don't know. You're you're probably going to get into some self destructive uh, ideology that will uh, that will ultimately be uh, be anti human. Right. It's so that's sad. It's, it's so, really so, so I want to share with you my experience on Twi on uh, YouTube, then I want you to share your experience too in the last four years. We've both been at this for about the same amount of time. So the first two years I put out videos and my comments were always like, oh man, you're so smart. Thank you for the information. I lost 20 pounds. It's all positive. And then I went to a Dr. Greger live lecture in Detroit and I saw, I saw him speak for an hour promoting his... As Dr. Greger? Yeah. Oh, there's probably 600 people. It was a vegan festival. So Did I have you touch a. Him? Did you touch his cloak? <laughs> no. He was so far away. This room was so big. I'm serious. But I was there. So I got a, a bar called the Good Fat Bar. It's And it's a vegan bar. There's no animal products in there. So I'm at this vegan festival and I'm promoting it. And it's like, hey, Dr. Greger's going to speak. He's the keynote speaker. So I told my business partner, I was like, I'm going to go check this out. I'll be right back. Well, I sat down and I'm like actually intrigued by what he's saying. And I sat there for an hour. And what he was saying is that um, you can, with the vegan diet, it can prevent or reverse uh, like maybe 15 of the top, you know, 20 causes of death or something like that. And as he went through these causes of death, I was like, wait a minute, but I've helped people with those conditions too but not with veganism, but rather low carb, you know, increasing fat and protein if they need to. Yeah, oh, well, we're same team. We're trying to do the same. We're thing. on the same team, exactly. And then, and then Gregor said that the vegan diet is a cleansing diet. And I was like, oh, that's why. Like it'll help the liver clean the blood. It'll, it is a cleansing diet. So I was like wrapping my brain around this. And at this time I had figured out what's called what the mechanism of chronic disease. I don't know if you've ever heard me talk about this in my videos. But back in the 30s and 40s, they said that lactic acidosis is the mechanism of chronic disease. Over the decades, that um, definition has changed. But if you go back to that era, it, to it makes total sense. And I work with that when I work with patients. But if you, were, if you do a vegan diet, you can actually affect one or two of the, of the four aspects of lactic acidosis. But I think it's really, really important that you get into ketosis. Because that is like the prime, one of the prime ways to fix this whole lactic acidosis scenario. So I did a video, this is where everything changes. And I say in the video that veganism helps with this aspect of lactic acidosis. And ketosis plus plants helps with more. So I said that this, veganism is better than the standard American diet, but getting into ketosis is better than veganism. And I was nice about it, and Gregor's a nice guy. And I said that in my video, he's a great guy. We're all on the same team, we're all trying to help. And I'm telling you from that point forward, month after month after month, being attacked by vegans in the comments section, and I delete comments, because I want my comment section to be educational and inspirational and helpful. Yeah, people, people try and complain if you delete comments and ban trolls. The people who are complaining are the ones that just want to pepper your thing with their links and just talk a bunch of shit about you in your in your own comment section. Right. Like, you'll come into my home and ride all over my chalkboard. <laughs> right. It's it's my YouTube channel. I'm gonna do what I want. Yeah. So so after that, I was like, why are they saying these things? So then I started watching Mike the Vegan and more Gregor videos and McDougal and like. And I'm like, I can't believe what these guys are saying. I cannot believe how off they are when they interpret the research, you know. So it's been, a, that was two years ago when all this started. So it's like, it's been quite transformational. And, then, and it's forced me to learn more. It's forced me to, you know, to get the other person's, you know, viewpoint. And then I get more confidence and more clinical results. I've gotten so much, you know, better clinically with it too. So it's actually been very, very helpful in my own regard, although quite emotionally, uh, kind of stressful sometimes, but you got to keep that, keep that out and just stick with the education, you know? Yeah, no, it can be, it can be hard. I mean, when you, when you kind of, when you speak against somebody else's ideas, somebody else's ideals, like they, 
there are armies of trolls who will will attack. I mean, it doesn't mean that anybody who disagrees with me is a troll or if right. you disagree with me, you're a troll. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, we've got, you know, civil disagreements with people all over the place. Um, but what I found starting YouTube, I don't know if it was five years, 2014 or something, I think I started making videos. And the first videos I put out was strictly about low carbohydrate diets. We were talking about keto, talked about using a ketogenic diet, interviewed a lot of experts in the field. I would get very little pushback until about, I think it was like a year in. And then this, there's a bigger, broader movement on vegan YouTube. You had guys like Durian Ryder and uh, Freely the Banana Girl who were definitely very against uh, low carbohydrate diets. And you would see their influence in the comment sections. Um, that started trickling in within the first year. Um, I find that, or so over the, I never really said anything against like vegan diets for the first three years of this channel. Um, it, I didn't find it was necessary. The whole vegan movement, it was a little bit more subdued. It was mostly just some crazy kooks on YouTube, like Durian Rider, Freely the Banana Girl, and stuff like that. Um, but then the last couple years, we started seeing this really big push from governments, from NGOs, from uh, you know, like Bill Gates talking about we've got to decrease our meat intake. And this whole tying it in with sustainability started happening. Um, so eventually I ended up feeling like it was time to actually talk about the downfalls of a vegan diet, a lot of the pitfalls people run into, how it's a nutrient deficient diet and how dangerous it really is. Now, when we first got into this whole diet, uh, Dr. Schmidt, we, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, we got into it because our daughter started getting dental caries. So she was a year old, her baby teeth were coming out, we call them the milk teeth. And they were basically living up to the name milk teeth. They were turning into like powdered milk. I remember one time we went to brush her teeth and you just see layers of it scraping off. Um, they ended up, uh, she lost a significant portion of many of her baby teeth. And that threw us down this whole rabbit hole of trying to figure out what it is that's causing dental caries. Because we'd also known other people whose kids had dental caries. And guess what? Those people had also experimented or were currently using a vegan diet. So we saw a lot of these kids, the developmental issues. We live in a community where there are, there's a lot of vegans, right? We live in a place where there are a lot of random expats from all over the world, a lot of these people who are into, you know, alternative stuff or trying to explore the, uh, the fringes of consciousness in society, they end up going to veganism because it's a safe counterculture that people can jump right into. So we met a lot of people whose kids were showing signs of autism, even though they weren't getting all these other, you know, these weren't kids who were getting, you know, loads of vaccines. These weren't kids who were um, raised in an area where there are loads of pesticides, but they're getting autism. They're having like major autistic behaviors, very young and dental caries. So this led me to, um, to really examining the diet a little bit deeper and this major push that happened with veganism, um, this kind of uh, militarization of vegan YouTube basically forced my hand to start putting out content against it. And I think it's I can't, you know, I'm, I'm not complaining at all. I know a lot of these vegans hate me. They think I'm like the vegan antichrist or something like that. And it's fine. Like we're not here to, to bash vegans. We're here to actually give you guys information. We're here as a sanctuary. You know, this is a vegan rescue operation. I don't think people understand. We're not here to bash vegans. We're here to help you guys out. And, um, that's kind of been my experience over the last year. We're trying to run this vegan rescue operation. People interpret it in different ways. Even long-term viewers complain to me and say, oh, it's so negative. You go, these hate videos. And it's like, hey, look, if you don't understand what we're doing, you don't have to watch. Right? Just don't complain to me in the, in the comments about it. But um, yeah, the, my experience with YouTube has changed a lot over the last year because it's kind of become this channel. One of the angles that this channel has taken is we're in full-on battle against veganism. Not vegans, not the vegan right. diet, <clears throat> veganism as a movement, as a political movement, we're here to take you down, right? And we're here to surgically <laughs> remove all of these, uh, these, these lesions, these cancerous lies that people are being told that a plant-based diet is superior for health and that pregnant women should do it and that all the children of the world should do it. Um, that's why we're here. So that's kind of my experience for uh with the YouTube thing and with the, you know, the negativity and comments. Look, I brought it, upon, I brought it upon myself, so I don't really complain. Yeah, no, I brought it upon myself too. But so as I'm reading 
or as I'm listening to the vegan leaders talk about why the diet is better, I had to come up with answers and figure out like, and so over the course of the next year, you know, once I made that Gregor video, um, I ended up making what's now a playlist that basically debunks every single pro-vegan argument. Um, so now when a vegan posts something on my YouTube channel, I just say, watch this. And I just put the link to the whole playlist and I say, everything that you could possibly come up with as a pro-vegan, it's debunked in this playlist, somewhere in this playlist. And they post back, well, you said this and it's wrong. And then my reply back is, you didn't watch the playlist because it's only been two minutes, you know, like stop talking, watch the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. And then I got to, I got to add in. So when, when you got like Sean Baker was uh, interviewed by Joe Rogan and then Michaela Peterson and Jordan Peterson, like that was super helpful, you know, talking about the carnivore diet and just taking this low carb thing and just stretching it out to something that's even more powerful and more extreme, if you will, but yet more natural for many people's genetic profile. Not everybody's, but there's more people that would benefit from the carnivore diet if they were to try it. You know, the only way to find out is if you actually just try it. So now then, so all that flack then goes to, it goes to Sean Baker and it goes to other people that are more carnivore. And it, like, it's been kind of lifted from my channel. Like I'm not getting attacked like I used to in the last year or so. Like Two, Sean, Baker. Sean Baker's on the front lines. Taking he's on the front lines. He's the guy taking the bullets now. <laughs> yeah, Sean Baker definitely threw a threw a, uh, a wrench in the whole vegan movement with getting on Joe Rogan. I thought that was a really cool thing. Um, it would have been cool if Joe Rogan would have maybe had somebody on like uh, like Andrew Scarborough. Have you? Oh you yeah. Andrew? Yeah, that's such a unique case right there. It's brilliant. Or keto diet to treat cancer as you know, alternative as a therapy for his brain tumor that he had removed years ago. He's been doing great with it. So I think cases like that are, are just awesome. The vegans, uh, you know, Sean Baker is like a lightning rod because he was a doctor. He had this controversial thing happen to him where his license was temporarily, uh, or I guess they call it, it was revoked. They revoked his license. Well, he gave it up, but he's got it back now. Yeah. yeah. Which is great. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah that, I think the Sean Baker thing definitely, it, it, it drew a lot of um, hordes of angry, of angry vegans. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do you think carnivore diet annoys the vegan movement so much? Because <laughs> it's so polar opposite of their message. <laughs> so I can say about that. Well, you know, I got to share with you, in the summer of 2016, I had a woman... What, I had just learned the um, Charlie Foundation's approach to uh, ketosis, which is high fat, which is for epilepsy, right? High fat, moderate protein, lower carb. Especially and, for children with epilepsy. Right? right. And you want that fat for their neurodevelopment. And it works, you know, I mean, there's you can change that for an adult that's diabetic, etc. But the point is... Um, I had a woman come in, she had cancer of her lungs that spread to her brain. And with the ketogenic diet, it was all gone in three months. And so like my fortitude... In, treatment or just straight, just ketogenic diet? Yeah, just a ketogenic diet because the, the MDs had given up on her with the chemo and all that. Wow. Yeah, so, and that's number, now we have, we've had 11 people with fantastic results regarding cancer and ketosis. Not just me. But I have other clinicians in the office too. So one, one of my other practitioners, she had a patient with bladder c cancer that went away, and another practitioner just got rid of cancer in two people. It, you know, clinically, if you're doing ke ketosis for cancer, you got to get the results within three months. If you don't get any results in three months, it's just not going to work. That's my opinion. That's my clinical experience. But I'm saying this because in tw in 2016, when this woman got better, it's like my, you know my uh, realizations on it and the relationship of like the Gerson therapy, which is plant-based, you know, like you can do several things to really help yourself out with, can with cancer and with horrible diseases. But the kicker is I have Dr. Gerson's original 1958 textbook on his therapy. It's called results of 50 cases. And I started reading through it and I realized he was fixing lactic acidosis, the mechanism of chronic disease, but he had his patients drinking three glasses of raw liver 
fresh, never frozen, not blended, but chopped up three glasses a day of raw liver. That's what people don't realize about Gershon. He was using beef liver. He was using raw beef liver in large quantities along with the organic vegetable juices. But later on, did they change it and they removed the liver? Yeah, they removed the liver because of access to it. They didn't have a good supply that was clean and they, you can't freeze it if you're going to... So yeah, it, it lost... When you remove the liver from the Gerson cancer therapy, it lost, it, it lost power. It lost some, you know, some results there. That's an interesting theory. And I've, I've, I think I've heard somebody say that before. Um, so I, I don't think you're alone in that assertion. I think there's other people who've said the same thing, that it, there's, there's something that's just not the same about Gerson therapy after they removed the, uh, the liver. Right. So this is a big plug for ketosis. And I think that people should get in ketosis several times a year, no matter who you are, no matter your genetics. I think at least four times a year you should be in ketosis, even for a couple of days. What about fasting? What's your, what's your opinion on fasting? You ever use that? Um, just me personally, I think it's, it's something that can be useful, but the extended fasting, especially when people are trying to lose body fat, I find it's, uh, I don't really recommend it much because like, there's a lot of people with uh, you know, disordered eating habits already, and I feel like it can kind of feed into that sometimes. But what are your, what are your thoughts on fasting well, and extended fasting? Yeah, the fasting is good for um, the autophagy and the, you know, bringing on new stem cells. So, you know, Jason Fung talks about this a lot. And when, when you have Ted Naiman talking about keep your protein up, lower your carbs, that'll, you know, lower your carbs and your fat, that'll make you lose weight, that'll get rid of your type 2 diabetes. That's a true statement, but the high protein prevents autophagy. So you want to recycle those old cells. You want to get a new influx of stem cells. So you know, on a case-by-case -case patient, uh, you know, scenario with my patients, I do have some patients doing extended fasts. I have a guy right now, he does one meal per week. And he's been doing that now for, what, five weeks or something like that. And I had a woman a year ago, uh, she had breast cancer, and I started her off with um, a five-day fasting mimicking diet. So it was super low calorie, it's just avocados and a green drink. She did that for five days. You know, and then, and then we changed her diet more higher calorie keto. And six weeks later, her breast cancer is gone. So yeah, it's, it's another therapy. There's a lot of therapies that uh, depending on lifestyle, depending on the patient's willingness, their ability, um, how, how deep do they want to go, then we get into the fasting. I have a patient now, he was pretty healthy to begin with. He just was really interested and in, he just retired. He wanted to increase his health tremendously. He did a 10-day fast. In the middle of it, he did 40 hours of dry fasting, so no water. Yeah. And then, and he, you know, had fantastic results. And he's told me recently that it took him, I think it was two months or three months to recover from that. You know, and I have a friend, he's another chiropractor, his name is Don. What does he mean by recover? Uh, get the physical strength back. And I don't know what other symptoms he had. I don't know if his appetite changed or something like that, but... It's, you know, it's pretty, it can be pretty traumatic to not eat, drink, eat, eat food or drink water. <laughs> so he recovered. Yeah, the refeeding thing, I mean, the, actually, some people get really major issues when they refeed. Especially yeah. after the longer fast. So I, I tend to, uh, I think fasting is powerful, but I think for <clears> that reason, something to be, be aware of, right? I mean, fasting, it's, kind of, it's like a gun. I mean, you can use it for, um, it's like any tool. You can use it for good or you can do a lot of damage with it. So I think, um, yeah, that's, that's right. an interesting anecdote, taking so long to recover from the fast. Some people, especially in the vegan world, you see a lot of people doing really intense fasting, right? Like they start on a vegan diet, maybe they feel a little bit better in the beginning, start getting the issues with the gut, with the, uh, with the mineral absorption, with the uh, possibly all the anti-nutrient contents in the diet. Then they start to think, well, maybe if I fast, I'll feel better. Some of them just end up fasting themselves like into a you know <clears throat> grave almost. Right. So it's actually would be better uh, to do multiple black fasts. Like a black fast might be five days. So with the with the five day fast, you get into ketosis by day two and a half or three, and then on day four you get the autophagy. Day five you get the stem cell surge, and then you come out of it. You know you do three weeks of healthy eating and do another five day 
black fast. That would be more sustainable in, instead of doing a 30-day fast. Yeah, that makes sense. Break it up into chunks. Yeah. Someone says in the chat, says they're chasing the dragon. <laughs> so, yeah, it really it becomes like that with you know, diet, fasting, with anything extreme for some people, it can be it can be dangerous. And I'm not saying it's bad for everybody, but you've got to understand there are situations. People people can latch on to fasting. I've seen people latch on to fasting just to justify an eating disorder. Right. Same thing with uh, yeah. other diets, raw veganism. A lot of people do the same thing. So they're justifying this really weird relationship they have with food through the fasting and they're telling themselves that it's good. But, hey, fasting's great. Just be careful, guys. Don't, yeah. don't fast yourself into the, into the grave. Yeah. Well, you know, we haven't really talked much about this, but I had black mold poisoning and that was uh, discovered three years ago and it was horrible. So I started supplements to detox and I can tell with my blood test that that's actually getting better. Right? There's a urine mycotoxin test and that those numbers are, most of those numbers are now normal. But my, auto, my immune system is still hyper-reactive to, you know, I got the antibodies for mold. And it's been consistently now three years, those numbers are still high. So I know that my next step is fasting to normalize the, my immune system's reaction to this, these things that I dealt with three years ago, or I'm still dealing with now. But So there's, there's another aspect of it when it comes to like autoimmune conditions. You can do, you can clean your liver, you can do various things, help improve your health, get your energy back, do carnivore if you want to. But then at some point, once you feel better, fasting would be good to help kill off the white blood cells that are still remembering the toxins that you had, the, you know, the mold that you had, etc. So kill off those dead white, you know, kill those dead white, I'm sorry, kill the, wet, the white blood cells and then bring in the naive white blood cells. Naive meaning they don't know what they're attacking yet because they haven't been exposed yet. That's, that's another really good reason for doing fasting. Interesting. But you, you, how, how much fasting are you planning on doing? Because, you know, whenever some people tell me they're about to do intense fasting, I do sometimes get worried because, you know, I mean, Tim Shee, for instance, like he was on a vegan diet. He was a very, uh, very talented athlete. He ended up doing this crazy long water fast and, um, just, I mean, it looked like, uh, what was that film with um, uh, the, the Machinist? Is that what it's called? Um, he ended up looking like that guy at the end, like uh, um, just somebody so emaciated. And it, and it worries me. So how, how, how much fasting do you plan on doing I don't know. In, your, in your routine for the, the black mold exposure? I'm not, I don't know. And I'm not looking forward to it. And I don't want to fast. I don't want to do it. But I know I need Why to. Do you do it help? Huh? Why, what do you think it's going to, you mentioned like the white blood cells cleaning out some of the old matter. Isn't there a way to get similar effects without having to do full fast? No, those white blood cells live a long time. They live years and years, five, seven years. I guess I could wait four more years and then they're all gone. But I want to fix this up right now. Yeah. So, um, but you know, like once you're in ketosis, you should be able to do a fast and be happy with it. And that's what people tell me over and over again. And all the teachers, all my mentors, they say the first couple, even my girlfriend's done five days of fasting. So the second day you're really grumpy. And then the third day you're in ketosis, you feel better. I'm just not looking forward to that second day. I, the second day is never. Look how th I'm super thin, you know, I need food. I'm the first guy to, to die when a famine hits. <laughs> that's why I don't want to do it another route that you could take where you wanted to fully fast you mentioned you were doing saunas and stuff is it, is it, what what is your protocol just uh, out of curiosity it, you don't have to share if you don't want to but what what is your protocol that you've been doing for the black mold exposure personally for yourself okay sauna at least twice a week i have a portable one in my house called therasage it's a full spectrum infrared it's not far inf huh i like that it's yeah like it's not just far infrared it's not just near infrared it's full spectrum infrared Brilliant. Um, twice a week at least. And then I got, a sup I got a couple of supplement companies that I like. They got good detox programs. One is Cellcore Biosciences. I'm doing that primarily right now. I used to do another one called um, True Cellular Detox from Systemic Formulas. I'm a big fan of both of these. And, and is, they got all the... In those uh, formulas that actually help pull the toxins out. What is it that, what's the active ingredients in those? Um, they both rely on binders, which means I call it special dirt. So there's bentonite clay and there's 
various types of carbon chains. The pills are actually black. The powder is black. So those powders go in your body and they grab onto things. Like here's the toxin. It just grabs onto it and your body gets rid of all that through the liver and the intestines. You don't want that leaving through your um, kidneys so much. The kidneys are a little bit more fragile. Um, but they got the clinical studies to back it up. Like, I, you know, I've had, I have people, they start taking these products and they're, now their stools smell like horrible, you know, or their urine smells like plastic or, you know, like their bodies are getting detoxed out. So I figure two years of this minimum to see what happens with my blood tests, my urine tests. So that's what pretty much. That? A lot of people say, especially like fitness industry folks, uh, we talked about uh, Lane Norton, PhD earlier, guys. Lane Norton, PhD, says that uh, that detox is a myth. That like none of these detoxes work. It's all just fake. Don't listen. Anybody who tells you to do a detox, I've, what do you think about that statement? What would be uh, be a response that you would give to somebody who takes that? Uh, zealous anti-detox approach that just comes from total ignorance i mean all i got to do is go on i mean the cdc measures for heavy metals you're going to tell the cdc i had somebody say this on twitter to me like where's your research on detox so i sent them some links and then they replied back dodgy and these <laughs> links these links were to there's a there's a company called um quicksilver scientific Quicksilver is a lab from Dr. Chris Shade. Brilliant, right? And so this guy on Twitter, you know, supposedly went to see the Quicksilver website and he calls it dodgy. And I said, well, if you think that's dodgy, then why don't you call every single hospital dodgy? Because if you go to an ER and you say, I just think I got exposed to mercury or I just swallowed lead paint, what are they going to do? They're going to test your blood for lead. They're going to test your blood for mercury. And if they find it, they're going to detox it with EDTA or DMSA or DMPS IV. So this is not dodgy stuff. This is already in the medical, it's in the hospitals, it's in the ER departments, it's in the CDC. So, but the difference is if that mercury is in your blood and it's there for three, it'll be there for three days. After three days, it goes into your tissues, your brain and your bones. Now it's not in your blood anymore. So if you wait too long, if you wait five days after your exposure, they're not going to find it. That's where the, like Dr. Chris Shade, that's where his company comes in, where you could do like a challenged urine uh, heavy metals test. And if you have chronic um, heavy metals in your body, that's a different therapy. You know, that's more extensive. That's where the supplements come in. And you just do before and after lab work. You can do blood work. You can do urine tests. And that's what I've been doing with the mycotoxins. So if somebody says that detox is a fallacy or a myth, it's just totally ignorant. And it's they the body's got so many different ways that it detoxifies when the liver detoxifies. Yeah. You mentioned saunas. What are you doing when you get into a sauna and you're sweating out a gallon of water in one day? You're detoxifying. Right. Know. Yeah, and, and you can do, there's tests on the infrared saunas do a better job of detoxing than the dry or wet saunas. So, and they just measure the toxins in the, in the sweat that comes out. You just measure that and infrared saunas are better. And the other saunas, are, they do just fine too. But the bottom line is, and, and the body does have its own natural abilities to detox. But you can have an overwhelming amount of toxicity. Like I was breathing black mold spores and mycotoxins for 13 years. And yeah, that'll have an effect on my body. And... I'm not going to just sit around and wait for my body to try to clear it out. I'm going to actually be proactive about it. And But there are things that are new on planet Earth that the body may not know what to do. That's the plastics like BPA or phthalates and stuff like that. So, But there's times in the past when volcanoes would blow up and there's mercury all over the place. So yeah, our bodies can get rid of mercury. But if you have mercury fillings in your teeth and they're off-gassing, you're going to have this much more mercury beyond what any of our ancestors ever had. Yeah. Did you have mercuries? Did you have the mercury? I did. Place? Yeah, I had five. I had them removed in 1998 or 99. And then I got poisoned with aluminum. And it was the type of filling, the new fillings that were put in. So I had the new fillings taken out and they put in porcelain. Mm -hmm. I've been fine ever since regarding the teeth. Those are five fillings I got in high school. 
Yeah, I had a, I had six uh, six teeth that had some of them had multiple fillings. I had all those removed, maybe a little bit too rapidly. Um, but yeah, that was kind of part of my the beginning of my health journey. It was just well, you had like you had the fillings taken out too fast. Well, well, what do you think? I mean, some people say you should stagger the removal of them. Yeah, you got to stagger. Like a couple at a time rather than getting them all removed in one day where you get a massive exposure to the, uh, the mercury vapor. Yeah. Yeah, I got a guy now, a patient who uh, he had uh, 13 fillings taken out all at once. And it completely destroyed his health. And you got to do it the right way. So there's a guy named Dr. Hal Huggins. And I don't know if, I think he's still around. He's he was teaching dentists a long time ago how to do it properly, and it's the Huggins Protocol. And they have a, they have a website, iaomt.org, to find um, a good biological dentist. So you got to do it right. You can't have just a regular dentist pull your mercury fillings out. They can destroy your health. I had a patient once. She was going to get some fillings replaced, and I and uh, I said, "Is this a biological dentist? Like, do they know what they're doing?" She goes, "Oh, I trust him." He's been my family dentist since forever. And I was like, no, you got to go to this other person. And she refused to listen to what I had to say. So she had the fillings taken out on Friday. And she came to see me on Monday. And she's crying as she's walking into the office. She's crying in the waiting room. She's crying in my treatment room. She goes, I've been crying all weekend. And I said, when did you have your fillings taken out? She said, Friday. And they said, you are mercury toxic. You had an acute poisoning of mercury. So I gave her some supplements and we had to fix that. But yeah, you don't want to mess with your teeth. <laughs> you know what's funny? Uh, so when I got the mercuries removed, they put the... I don't, you said porcelain. I don't know if it was porcelain that I had put in my... I thought it was like a... It seemed like it's like a plastic polymer type thing. There were those white fillings. Maybe it's porcelain. But what's funny is over the years... All of those have come out. Like oh, they've really? Actually, they've come out of my mouth, and I, maybe I swallowed some of them. Who knows? But it's funny because none of, like, I have no cavities. Right? There's no sensitive spots in my teeth whatsoever. And increasing the animal fats and really focusing on you know, grass-fed butter, uh, liver. So wait, let me get this right. So what you're, what you're saying is where the cavities were, those fillings are gone. You never had any new ones put in. No, they put in new ones, but then those ones came out. Like they they were like these plastic, you know, the white porcelain fillings, and I could feel the holes in the teeth where those have like over the years they just they came out. <laughs> um, so now your teeth there's are no sensitivity, and there was no cavities there anymore. Yeah, that's good. Strong teeth. I had it's one. It's anecdotal, guys. Don't don't. Go yeah, it's n equals one. Just ignore it. I had I did a live. I don't do live streams very. I don't hardly ever do live streams. But I had one for an hour when it hit a hundred thousand subscribers. And I'm reading the comments, and somebody says, what do you do for loose teeth? And I said, eat meat. I'm like, that's it. If your teeth are loose, man, everything's loose. From inside, you know, like all your ligaments and tendons are going to be loose, and you got to strengthen that up. You need some protein. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. People don't realize that, you know, the, the animal foods, the fats, animal fat and protein, they, you, you mentioned the word superfood earlier. And that's one of those words that's like thrown around there way too often, right? Those superfood. Yeah. Get my goji berries, superfood, $13 a pound, superfood. And it's like most of these superfoods are a joke. Like you know, bitter little fruits like gojis. Uh, there's nothing really that special about those. They're full of lectins and oxalate. But, but, man, when you look at meat, when you look at liver, when you look at uh, bone marrow, some of these foods, even the brain, they're like, these are true superfoods that give you everything you need. You cannot, I think, well, going back to, we were talking about carnivore diet earlier. It's so funny because you know, we talk about veganism a little bit too. And it's well known that you cannot live off of plants alone without heavy supplementation, right? You need vitamin B12. You're going to need the DHA, the EPA. But people are showing, people have been doing it for years. People have been doing it for decades that you can live off of just meat. Um, and a lot of people do much better that way. I'm not saying everyone should do it, but even uh, I've got Dr. Darren Schmidt over here who's been doing a carnivore diet and experimenting with it. And he's finding the, benef uh, the benefits of it are pretty profound as well. So, um, yeah, let's see. We've gone for 
least an hour and a half now. You got anything else you want to talk about? Any other topics you want to touch on? We covered a lot. We did, man. We went all over. I mean, uh, I'd love to do it again. I'd love to have you on uh, another time soon. It's um, It's been great talking. Where can people find Dr. Darren Schmidt, other than the YouTube channel that you run, which there's a link right down in the description below to Dr. Darren Schmidt's YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe and check out his content. Where else can people find more? Well, the main office website is the nutritionalhealingcenter.com. Awesome. And that's where people come in to become a patient. You can talk to my staff. I got like, I think 26 employees now. Um, that includes the uh, six other practitioners in the office. That's my main website. We, I got the Good Fat Bar. I got the Heritage Glandular Supplement I made with a friend. So it's a multi-glandular. It's nine glands put together in one pill. So, so if you don't want to eat liver, you can take the pill. If you don't get, have access to uh, adrenal, you can take the pill. So I have a few other ventures going on like that. Awesome, man. Well, Dr. Darren Schmidt, it's been awesome talking. Uh, we've gone all over the place. We went from why he's no longer vegan, talked about keto, talked about carnivore, even talked about detoxification of toxic mold, which I think people would be surprised how many of us have been exposed to this. Uh, I know when I was in college, uh, I had a friend who was suffering really badly in the dorms. You'll like the, this, this story is pretty funny. In the dorms and uh, the school that yeah. we went to, they were just terribly maintained. And there was lots of moisture and lots of leaks and stuff. And some of these rooms were so full of black mold. I had a friend, he was bleeding from his nose. He was blowing blood out of his nose regularly. Uh, and I'm pretty sure his health suffered after that as well. I haven't talked to him in years. But man, that toxic mold, I, uh, I wish you the best in the detoxification of that. Thanks, it's going all right. See, I mean, I've, I've been getting results. Coming into this office now, the new building in June of last year made such a huge difference. And, um, you know, the CDC says the first symptom of mold is uh, nose, sinuses, and the last symptom is breast cancer or prostate cancer. And the CDC has, in the last year and a half, they've been doing a marketing sort of awareness campaign about mold to patients like you and me. They want patients to tell their doctor, think mold. And that's their slogan is think mold with an exc exclamation point. So 70% of buildings in the United States have enough black mold to negatively affect the inhabitants. So dorms are horrible. Hotels, horrible. And then if you have a basement or an attic, you got to check it out. If you have a sink, <laughs> you got to check that out underneath the cabinet, behind the wall, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think people would be surprised. I mean, they're not trying to freak anybody out here, but there are environmental toxins, environmental exposure to things like mold, non-native electromagnetic fields from Wi-Fi, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. These can have powerful effects on the human body, and we barely even touch the surface. Oh, yeah. Darren's shaking his head because he knows, man. This stuff goes it goes pretty deep. So uh, you guys can find more uh, Dr. Darren Schmidt on YouTube. And then uh, what was the name of your website again? TheNutritionalHealingCenter.com. There you go. You guys can find more there. Um, we've got the next Keto and Carnivore Collective starting. This is the last week to sign up for that, the Keto and Carnivore Collective. It's our group coaching experience where we're able to do it in a community setting to a, where you have the support of not only your coaches, but each other. And the goal is to teach you how to do a low-carbohydrate, ketogenic, or carnivore diet long-term to where you're not having to constantly come back to coaches. We want to teach you how to do this and how to do it right. So check out Dr. Schmidt's site and then check out the Keto and Carnivore Collective down below in the link. It's the last week to sign up for that. Dr. Darren Schmidt, it's been an honor, man. I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Tristan. Thank you for having me on.